Louisa, the dreaded topic of gastric ulcers. Um, me, personally, my experience with my horse, uh, he just sort of lost weight suddenly. It was quite quickly, I hadn't changed his feed, he's having adequate feed, and just getting quite nervous at pre and post competitions. What can other horse owners like me sort of expect to see signs and symptoms relating to ulcers? Yeah, so um, changing in eating habits is really common. <laughs> <laughs> um, they might also see changes associated with ridden um, exercise. The horse might become uncooperative um, or he may just not be performing as well as, as what he had been. Other signs might include becoming sensitive to touch, dislike being groomed, become girthy, dislike being tacked up. Negative behaviours associated with seeing the tack is common. Yeah. Um, I think what it's really important to acknowledge is that the signs we now commonly associate with gastric ulcers are not specific to them. We can see horses dropping weight with problems like liver disease. We can see bad behaviour when ridden when horses are lame. So we really must push for a diagnosis. Okay, so it's fair to say the signs and symptoms aren't straightforward and Definitely clear. Definitely not, no. So, for example, then you want to go for your gastric scope. Do you have to do that? Why can't you just treat for ulcers? Another really good question. So um, what we know now is that the, we're treating two different types of ulcers in the horse's stomach. They sometimes require different medication and to be treated for different lengths of time. Unless we scope the horse in the first place and then during and at, hopefully at the end of treatment as well, we're not going to know if we have successfully treated and eliminated those ulcers. If we stop that treatment before they're fully healed, they're going to come straight back. Yeah. So getting the right diagnosis is really important. The other thing we should say is all of those signs that we reeled off, we can see, we can, we can have horses that present with those problems and their stomach is completely clear. Okay. So you might be treating unnecessarily. Also, some horses might have very, very mild signs. So it may be as simple as they're not quite so keen for their breakfast or perhaps he's not performing quite as well as he used to. And they can have really severe ulcers. So for horses like that, presumptive treatment might mean that you're treating unnecessarily or you're not going to provide enough treatment. He might need a lot more than what you're going to offer. Yeah, so the gastroscope is, is the way to find out exactly what the issue is. So say um, we scope my horse, gastro, also, and he did have ulcers. What is my future? What, what, what can I look at long term? And what tips do you have um, for prevention or, or carrying on to make the horse perform to its best, even given the diagnosis? Yeah, so we know that um, horses that have had gastric ulcers can go back to their previous job. But we also know that without dietary and lifestyle modifications, um, there's a high chance of them coming back. Yeah. So when we are treating for gastric ulcers, yes, we need to, to, to use the medication to resolve the ulcers, but we then need to have a broader look at the way the horse is managed, his workload and his lifestyle to see what we can do to reduce the chances of them, them coming back. Uh, Louisa, early on it was interesting you said sort of the diagnosis and which type of ulcer. Sorry to sound sort of naive, but what do you mean by the different types of ulcers? So in the horse's stomach, um, we can have ulcers develop in two different places. The, the one we've known about for longest, longest and we're most comfortable with treating are the squamous ulcers, so the acid splash ulcers. The ones that um, are more challenging from a veterinary perspective are the glandular ulcers, the ones that are found at the exit to the tummy where the food goes out. Despite them both being um, in the stomach, they represent two very different disease processes right. um, and the long-term management strategies are slightly different. So let's take a closer look at that acid splash in practice. So this represents a horse's tummy, okay? If we say the sensitive part of the tummy is at the top, so the lid, this horse has had access to long fibre up until the time that he was ridden. Okay, both of these chambers have got the same amount of water in representing the acid. Angus knows there's something in there, <laughs> don't you? So if we put this horse into trot and then into canter, let's see what happens. Okay. So the, the, as you can see there, there's no water coming up and touching that lid. 
it's all trapped underneath at the bottom. Yeah, there's not much splashing. Absolutely no splashing going on there. If, if we compare that to a horse that hasn't been fed for a few hours before he's been ridden, okay? And we put this horse into trot and then canter. Yeah, that's really sloshing around. Yeah, it? so he's got no fibrous mat there to protect the top of the tummy from the acid that's going to be present at the bottom. Well, Louise, that really explains why your horse wants access to fibre at all times. It's like a fascinating demonstration to see. Yeah, especially before exercise. Um, so common pitfalls that you see are when horses are exercised straight after they've traveled so perhaps they haven't had access to a hay net while traveling and then they go straight into exercise when they get off the box at a competition or most commonly in the winter especially at this time of year it's february there's no grass in the paddocks mm. the horses have been turned out but there's not really anything for them to eat and they haven't got any hay out there either they're brought in in the afternoon and they're ridden straight away and as a result there's no fibrous mat really in that tummy. Louise that's so interesting because as an owner you think you put your horse out to grass it's gone out you know all morning you're doing the right thing you're bringing it in and then you're riding it but actually because of the time of year or, or there isn't enough fiber in the stomach then it's not getting really what it needs to absorb all of that acid naturally exactly in the we could see the same thing in the summer when it's really dry and the yeah. grass isn't growing so the best thing you can do is bring the horse in and give it access to a hay net or offer it um, some chaff you know the ideal thing would be to to take him onto some long grass and let him graze for a little while but in reality we don't have time to do that but yeah offering a hay net or a small fiber meal before they exercise you can see it make a massive difference Squamous horses, we've been talking about the splashing effect. Angus, Vicky's kindly brought Angus into the arena for us to have a look and in that canter. So just talk about how that splashing sort of can happen. Yeah, so, um, you know, just, just watching him there, you can imagine with those back legs coming forward, um, how that's pushing all the contents of his abdomen forwards as well. So exactly that splashing motion that we talked about earlier with the jars. When we're talking about squamous ulcers, we've also got to think, the other two risk factors, along with having low fibre in the diet, is going to be if there's a lot of starch going in, which ferments while it's in the, in the tummy and will make the stomach contents more acidic, right. but also the intensity of the exercise that they're doing. So a horse that is um, in relatively heavy work, doing a lot of cantering um, and, and jumping, is going to increase the chances of the acid splashing up into that vulnerable area. So if we're looking at how to reduce the incidence of squamous ulcers, we want to increase the fibre in the diet, reduce the starch content of the diet, and modify the exercise regime to reduce the amount of intense work the horse is doing. Okay, so in different step when we talk about glandular ulcers then, a uh, slightly different sort of subject matter here. What, what is the big difference and why is it more complex with the glandular? Yeah, so the glandular region of the stomach has a natural acid defense built in. So this isn't about acid being in contact with the part of the stomach that it shouldn't be. It's about a failure of the natural defense mechanism in that part of the stomach, which in itself is complex and we don't understand it entirely at the moment. What we do know um, is that stress is basically the elephant in the room with, with those ulcers. So that's where having a look at the horse's general management and lifestyle comes into it. Right. Um, that said, we still do advise the same um, changes of management. So, you know, thinking about providing fibre because horses find it stressful when they, do, when they can't eat or the majority of them do. They're grazing animals. Exactly, naturally. they're designed to eat for 16 hours a day. It's a natural behaviour for them. Um, reducing the starch in the diet should help to um, equalise mood. We know that high starch diets make horses more excitable. Mm. Um, and when it comes to exercise, rather than focusing on the intensity of the exercise with glandular ulcers, it's more to do with how regularly you work the horses. So with glandular ulcers, we're far more looking at giving them two days off a week um, rather than working them every single day. Right, that's interesting. So the intensity and the velocity of them, the, the speed, the fast works, you need to give a bit of time off to let everything sort of settle. Yeah, whereas we know the, the horses with glandular ulcers can be working 
hard. It's not the how hard, um, the intensity of the work, so how explosive it is. It's how regular it is. So for the glandular ulcers, it's more about rest days. So we've spoken about the different types of ulcers, but where do these supplements come in then? Yeah, so I think it's really important to say that the the key to getting these horses right is their management and their diet. Supplements do play a role, but you've got to get those two things right first. So when we're looking at supp gastric supplements, there's now a really good amount of evidence to suggest that it's a worthwhile thing to do. Um, when we're looking at what we can do for a horse with a gastric supplement, our main aim is to try and create a soothing alkali gel that will help to line the stomach and protect it a little as well. So what do we want for that? We need, we need a, a, an antacid or a buffer um, alongside some ingredients that will form a soothing gel. Yeah. Um, the other thing that um, has become uh, more important with the glandular ulcers is we've acknowledged that the horses with those, those ulcers are undergoing oxidative stress. So we want to put in um, antioxidants, so vitamin C and vitamin E. So um, if we look at gastrokind, in there we've got um, an antacid with some gelling agents um, alongside vitamin C and vitamin E to provide antioxidant support. So the supplement adds a, a great support but we've got to have the other two factors to give, to give the whole clearer and better picture. So exactly. The diet and the work. Really. You can't expect to, to fix a horse with just a supplement without modifying the rest of its lifestyle. <laughs>